If you're even remotely familiar with Israel and Palestine, then you've probably seen this image. It was the handshake of the century. A handshake that symbolized the end, or at least the beginning of the end, of a decades-long conflict. We bid them shalom, salam, peace. But behind the photo op, a much more sinister picture was playing out on the ground. I think Edward Said said it best when he described the Oslo Accords as a Palestinian Versailles, in other words, complete capitulation. Created to solve the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Oslo Accords were meant to kick off a five-year process that would end with peace in the region and an independent Palestinian state. But now, 30 years later, the reality on the ground bears little resemblance to what was promised. I belong to a generation that has lived its entire life under this Oslo framework which had, uh, it's a facade of a framework that has brought us nothing but increased Israeli oppression and violence. Many critics of the accord say that the Oslo process was actually set up to fail. Do you agree with that characterization? No, no. The agreements were set up in order to sell out the Palestinians. Before that fateful day on the White House lawn in 1993, there was a lot happening for Palestinians. In the late 80s, the Palestinian streets were in upheaval. It had been two decades since Israel occupied the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, and Palestinians were fed up. There was an intifada, with the first intifada, which really was a source of, let's say, self-confidence, optimism, even joy. Despite the pain and the suffering, people were confident. People knew that they were standing up to the occupation. In the fall of 1991, the world convened in Madrid for a peace conference. Sponsored by the U.S. and the Soviet Union, it was the first time Israel and the Palestinians were engaging in direct negotiations. The Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, which operated from exile in Tunisia, was barred from attending. And so, a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation was tasked with representing the Palestinian people instead. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi was one of the advisors to the delegation. By transferring the Palestinians to Jordan and saying, there, you have a country. We went with, with a sense of mission, that we are representing a people who have dignity, who have rights, who have courage, who have defied this military occupation, and we are going to present ourselves to the world, and we are going to extract our rights. So we were confident, and there was a spirit of optimism, maybe naivete, if you will. The Madrid conference set the stage for years of peace negotiations facilitated by Washington and Moscow. And despite its flaws, those involved in the Madrid conference seemed hopeful. And when we came back, people believed that they could achieve liberation through a political process. But that, these were dashed afterwards completely. While public negotiations were being held on the global stage, a different set of agreements were being negotiated behind closed doors. In 1993, in Oslo, Norway, two unlikely partners struck a deal. The PLO, a militant liberation organization, recognized the state of Israel. In exchange, Israel recognized the PLO as a, quote, representative of the Palestinian people. However, Israel didn't recognize the Palestinians' right to sovereignty or self-determination. Despite the built-in power imbalance, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Chairman of the PLO Yasser Arafat shook hands on September 13, 1993, as the first Oslo Accords were signed. And while many Palestinians celebrated the move, hoping it could bring about change, Others weren't as optimistic. So there was nothing about the stopping of settlements. There was nothing about Jerusalem. There was nothing about refugees. There was nothing about sovereignty. It was a complete sham. So when I saw that agreement, I was extremely disappointed, but I was extremely concerned that 
the built-in flaws, the serious, the serious obstacles within the agreement itself, conceptually, and in many ways, would backfire. The Oslo Accords were a pair of agreements, signed between 93 and 95, that laid the foundation for the Oslo process, a so-called peace process that was to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So what exactly did the Accords say, and why were they so controversial? The Palestinians were told that the Oslo Accords would be um, a peace process uh, and that over an interim period Palestinians would be led to uh, eventual statehood and it was designed to be a phased process so at each stage uh, Palestinians would be granted more and more sovereignty. In a nutshell, the agreements laid out the plans for the following. An independent Palestinian state along the 67 borders, Israel's withdrawal from certain areas of the West Bank and Gaza, the division of the West Bank into various areas of joint Israeli and Palestinian control, the economic and security relationships between the two, and most notably, the establishment of the Palestinian National Authority, an interim body with limited autonomy that would rule over certain areas of the West Bank and Gaza until final status negotiations were held. But the Accords never actually agreed upon any of the major issues plaguing the Palestinian struggle. The borders of a future state, illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, the return of Palestinian refugees to their homes, and the status of Jerusalem as a capital. To its critics, the Oslo Accords were intentionally vague and designed in a way that essentially set the Palestinians up for failure. There was never any intention to accept any kind of sovereignty or self-determination for the Palestinians. One of the key points of the Accords that would later prove to be disastrous for the Palestinians was the division of the West Bank into areas A, B, and C. The newly formed Palestinian Authority was given control over Area A, which made up only 18% of the West Bank. Just over 20% became Area B, an area of joint control with the Palestinians controlling civil affairs like healthcare and education, and the Israelis controlling security. In both areas A and B, Israeli authorities maintained full external security control and the right to conduct raids inside PA-controlled areas. The rest of the West Bank, which makes up more than 60% of the territory, was placed under full Israeli control as Area C. In other words, in the majority of what was to become the future Palestinian state, Israel still controlled everything. The big question is, why did the Palestinians agree to this? So when the Palestinian leadership came uh, to the Oslo Accords, they came as a leadership in exile. Many of them had no experience of, of Palestine um, or what Palestine looked like on the ground. They've been a leadership in exile for so long. And there's a, there's a common anecdote that, you know, the Israelis came to the Oslo Accords with maps uh, very detailed maps while the Palestinian leadership came to the Oslo Accords with sandwiches. The Israelis had all the power uh, on their side, they had all the people in their corner, whereas the Palestinians were coming from a very weak place. And when you come from a very weak place to negotiate uh, for land, for statehood, I think it's inevitable that you're going to lose out. In the years after the first Oslo Accords were signed, a lot was happening on the ground. The Palestinians were in the process of forming their new interim government, and hundreds of Palestinians previously in exile were returning home. But amidst the brief period of excitement for the Palestinians, the facts on the ground were changing rapidly. By 1999, when the five-year interim period laid out by the Accords had ended, little had been accomplished in terms of final status negotiations. Israel hadn't followed through on its promises to fully withdraw from certain areas of the West Bank and Gaza. And despite promises to halt settlement construction, the settler population in the West Bank had increased by nearly 100%. And in 2000, the Second Intifada erupted. Israel's military forces reoccupied the West Bank, and the next few years were marred by mass killings, arrests, and the construction of a wall that separated communities and swallowed up even more Palestinian land. Whatever fragments had remained of a peace process vanished. 
In reality, what we saw was that the West Bank was completely divided up into Bantustans. Uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank were completely separated from each other. The Palestinian leadership was turned into this uh, service uh, functioning body and Palestinians were deprived of complete autonomy. In the midst of the Second Intifada, America's attempts to revive a peace process proved to be futile. And yet, though the peace process was dead in the water, the framework laid out by the Oslo Accords remained in place, meaning that Palestinians were left with a government that was meant to be temporary, and a homeland that was more fragmented than ever before. And Israel, through military force, still had control over the borders, resources, and effectively the lives of millions of Palestinians. Lots of promises were made to the Palestinian people in the Oslo Accords. Have any of those promises been upheld over the past 30 years? Well, the key promise of Oslo was Palestinian statehood, and we know that, hasn't, that has obviously not been achieved. Instead, what we see is these little pockets of false Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank. The only people that have won from the Oslo Accords or who have actually gained are the Israelis, the Israeli regime, which now controls the West Bank in its entirety, has Gaza under siege, um, and, and basically has looted um, all of the Palestinian resources, and this was laid out in the Oslo Accords. So Oslo handed over, you know, exactly what the Israeli regime wanted, which was more land and less Palestinians. In the years following the signing of the Oslo Accords, Palestinians witnessed their spaces shrinking rapidly, as Israel promoted vast settlement construction deep within the occupied West Bank and Jerusalem. In the year 2000, the settler population in the West Bank stood just over 190,000. Today, that number has more than doubled. Actually, the situation has increased more than before Oslo. I remember on the level of Israel, the level of Israel, at the moment, it is now representing one of the largest settlements in the West Bank. It is the fourth largest settlement. بالثمانينات قبل أوسلو كانت عبارة عن كونتينرات كم كونتينر وشوف اليوم كديش اليوم جامعات ومدينة وبتلم كل كل المستوطنين فيها وهي هاي هي هاي أصلاً أوسلو شو عملت لنا غير إنه جابت لنا لورا أكثر من لقدام. The increase in settler population, along with an extreme right-wing Israeli government, has meant a significant increase in settler violence, with Palestinian civilians on the front lines. Because the PA doesn't have security jurisdiction in more than 80% of the West Bank, most Palestinians are left to fend for themselves against violent settlers and Israeli soldiers. In 2023, the government of the Palestinians and the government of the Palestinians from the attack on the Quran, from the attack Do you feel like you have safety and security, or like there's anyone to protect you? The state of Oslo is one of the agreements هي أصلاً أصلاً الاحتلال هو محجم دورها فلذلك أنا كيف بدي يحميني اللي هي حكومتي أو دولتي بدها تحميني وهي أصلاً الاحتلال هو محجم صلاحياتها كيف بدي يحميني فلذلك إحنا إذا أهل الكرة بشكل عام أو أي منطقة فيها مستوطنين إذا البلد نفسها ما حمت نفسها ما في حد يحميك الموت ولا المدلة الموت ولا المدلة as the Oslo Accords were signed, a new generation of Palestinians were being born. A generation that would come to be known as the Oslo Generation. They were a youth defined by false promises and loss. Loss of life, of land, and the freedom to choose their own future. So we witness our own family and friends being killed and arrested on a daily basis. Um, we get humiliated at military checkpoints whenever we're trying to leave or enter our cities or villages. Uh, and we witness our people being expelled from their land while more and more settlements are being built in their place. And when you see around you checkpoints, violence, settlements, but then you hear Palestinian leaders and the international community still talking about a two-state solution, what, how does that feel to you? Do you feel like there's just this huge gap between, you know, 
Palestinian citizens like yourself and then the leaders who are on the global stage? Sure, as I said, it, uh, it may be more convenient for them to stick to that framework, but it's very unrealistic and naive to still uh, hang on to it because Israel has systematically destroyed the two-state solution. And uh, to us as well, it feels uh, insulting and disrespectful to keep talking about this when, uh, in theory, when on the ground, it's the complete opposite uh, of, of what's happening. In the 30 years since the first accords were signed, the interim Palestinian Authority became permanent. Elections haven't been held in 17 years, and PA leaders in the West Bank, with the support of America and the West, have consolidated power in the hands of a few elites, while growing increasingly authoritarian, cracking down on any forms of dissent. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hamas authorities in Gaza, who came to power following the 2006 elections, have done much of the same. When you're in your 70s and 80s and you want to hold on without accepting any kind of oversight, any kind of accountability, without your, your people having a say huh, in assessing whether you have, they want to re-elect you or they want to change you, or, this is a violation of an inherent and basic human right, a democratic right, for people to choose and to be part of the system of change. And the worst thing you can do to a people, collectively or individually, is loss of hope. So you are 25 years old, but you have never voted or participated in a national election, is that correct? That's true. How does that make you feel? It's frustrating because uh, we should be able to elect our own government uh, in a democratic uh, way. This government should uh, reflect uh, our interests and, 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 and manage the needs of the Palestinian people and represent us in, in, a, in a true way. But uh, on the contrary, it's, it's actually um, serving the interests of the few at the expense of the majority here in Palestine. And when we talk about Palestinian youth, they do form the majority of the Palestinian population. So for us young Palestinians, it is again very frustrating to see that this government uh, is not really uh, working in, in our interest, but oftentimes unfortunately against us. Today, the Palestinians who were born the year the Oslo Accords were signed turned 30. But their economic, social and political prospects are bleak. Unemployment is close to 25%. In Gaza, that number is closer to 50. All the while, Israel's grip on Palestinian life grows ever tighter. The situation on the ground has grown desperate, causing many young Palestinians to take matters into their own hands. Armed resistance groups made up of mostly young Palestinians are growing, and they're seeing massive popular support. But both the Israeli and Palestinian governments have deemed these armed militias as a threat to their power and control. As part of its policy of security coordination with the Israelis, which was outlined in the Oslo Accords, the PA has hunted down and arrested dozens of Palestinian fighters. <laughs> فمش شعرين بأمان نهائيا يعني بوجودهم يعني نهائيا نهائيا وحتى كاعدين بيشتغلوا بالوقت الحالي ضدنا يعني أنت بتحكي الشباب في مخيم جنين مستهدفة من الجهة الإسرائيلية والجهة الفلسطينية صحيح يعني إحنا مش شعرين بأمان نهائيا هو ضدنا الجيش الإسرائيلي ولا هي السلطة يعني كاعدين حتى هسا بيعرضوا علينا إن نسلم أنفسنا وانطونا رواتب وانطونا إن نسلم سلاحنا ونتنازل عن هاي القضية اللي إحنا كاعدين نكاتل عليها عشان نكاتل فا ولا مرة يعني مش راح نوقف عن هاي الطريق يعني راح نضلنا مكملين إن شاء الله يعني أما النصر أما الشهادة يعني إن شاء الله. But the PA's attempts to curb Palestinian resistance against the status quo only seems to be backfiring. Public opinion polls from this year show that 68% of Palestinians support armed resistance groups. And more than half of Palestinians believe that the continued existence of the Palestinian Authority serves Israel's interests, not the interests of the Palestinian people. I mean, this is a leadership um, that has led us to a situation where we live in Bantustan, and essentially in, in ghettos in, in the West Bank, Gaza, and colonized Palestine. Um, so we have to reckon with that, and that is internal work that Palestinians have to focus on. What does the future look like for Palestinians? I mean, can any 
future even be planned with the current systems and government in place? Um, for us to have a brighter future, we have to take a very good look at our leadership and reassess um, what we want that leadership to look like. Do we want it to be a leadership um, that capitulates, that collaborates with our oppressors, or do we want a leadership um, that is revolutionary and centers our freedom um, in, their, in their narrative? And I think the, it has to be the latter.